I'm assuming that you just came from the ACRA. Probably the hot topic there was immigration. So I don't know whether we'll have to cover that or not. But if we have time, we'll hear your thoughts on that. But I, it's always a, a great opportunity for us when we when we have the have the opportunity to uh, have our state or federal and federal legislators come here. Uh, so it gives us a time to discuss some of our local issues and concerns, and, and hopefully. Uh, educate you in terms of what's going on, what some of our needs are. So we'll uh, we'll discuss some of those items and then give you an opportunity as well to has have have a discussion on, on some of those issues and then also uh, hear what else you're working on in D.C. that may be specific uh, specifically uh, for us and not only Picking County but the Rolling Fork Valley. True. So again, I appreciate you being here and the time you're giving us. I know you you're, you're probably getting a. Uh, uh, the, the go around here. It's good. All good. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start. And, and one of the issues that, that we've had an opportunity to discuss with you in the past here, and actually when I visit you in D.C., uh, is the issue regarding the Thompson Divide. And I, I want to first acknowledge and thank you for your openness in terms of uh, listening to the debate on both sides and, and certainly appreciate your uh, the last. Um, public hearing you had down in Glenwood where you actually acknowledge that there are some unique and special places in the country that should be uh, set aside and protected from oil and gas development. So I, I appreciate that. The, um, as you know, um, Senator Bennett has uh, put forth his Thompson Divide withdrawal bill, uh, which specifically talks about uh, limiting any future oil and gas exploration on the public lands within the Thompson Divide. And uh, of course, again, as you know, that has gotten broad support um, throughout the valley. It's gotten, uh, because of the, everyone understands uh, not only the environmental aspects of it, but the economic aspects of it. And of course, in Picking County and, and in, um, throughout the Roaring Fork Valley, it's our belief that the, the environment is what drives the economy, not the other way around. And so, as you may have known, that there's a recent analysis that has been done regarding the, uh, the economy uh, that's generated from the Thompson Divide uh, that includes about 300 jobs, uh, which contributes about $30 million annually to the local community. And that economy is based on historic ag. It's based on hunting and fishing opportunities and recreation. So it's a sustainable economy based on a sustainable environment. So what I'm asking you today is to um, follow your Colorado colleagues, uh, Senator Bennett, Senator Udall, Governor Hickenlooper, uh, all the elected officials within the Rolling Fork Valley, uh, which includes five, five municipalities between Aspen and Glenwood, and uh, also Board of County Commissioners from three counties, Pickens County, Gunnison County, and Garfield County, and to, uh, to sign on and support Senator Bennett's uh, uh, Thompson Divide Withdrawal Bill um, and support the efforts not only of all the elected officials, but certainly all the constituents uh, of yours in the Roaring Fork Valley. Uh, they also understand the importance of protecting this unique area. So that's what I'm asking you uh, today on behalf of Pickett County and the Royal Fork Valley is to, is to sign on and support Senator Bennett's bill. We had this conversation about well, several months ago with uh, Senator Udall, and, and some may, may have thought that that was sort of a fait accompli, but we never take anything for granted. So we had a long conversation with Senator Udall, talked about these same issues, uh, and, and he left us uh, saying that uh, he would give it strong consideration and, and uh, make a decision within a short period of time. And as you know, about a month ago or so, he came out in support of Senator Bennett's bill. Did you want me to come in on that? Please. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we've certainly taken a look at that. As you're probably aware, there's some discussions that are going on right now. Uh, you know, uh, in between the, some of the Thompson Divide Coalition uh, and uh, some of the, the private lease interests that are in uh, that. And that is, from my, my perception, that, that's the best solution. Uh, 
uh, because with federal legislation, uh, it also has unintended consequences of precedent uh, that can impact other areas as well uh, that will be there. Uh, you know, we've, we've sat down, as you all know, we've reached out to the Thompson Divide Coalition. Uh, I held the first meeting that was there to be able to bring the two parties together. We'd invited both of our senators uh, to, to come to that. I think they sent re representatives. Uh, and so we've seen some good communication that's going on on that. And we want to be very cautious, I think, uh, in terms of proffering, putting forward legislation that can perhaps interrupt some other conversations uh, that are going on that can achieve the same end without getting the federal government involved in the process. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments? The, uh, the bill, my understanding of the bill is, and, and just to kind of continue the discussion, because we've had lengthy discussions, obviously we're very involved with, uh, with the process here, mm -hmm. is that the bill really just looks at future leases. So the existing leases, it, it doesn't stop the conversation. It actually helps the conversation in the fact that it gets an end point to protecting those uh, those lands over a, you know the, the long period of time when an agreement is made with the coalition or potentially made with the coalition and the, and the current leaseholders the fear that we have is that we invest or even buy out the leases and we being the people of this area whether it be private money or you know through taxpayer dollars if 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 a ballot question gets passed towards that that once the leases are bought out, then it could be released. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there could be other leases in that area. And so all that money spent and nothing gained, and which is which Bennett's bill really does is protect that second step from happening. Um, and I think it helps the conversation more than it hurts it. Um, I'm a restaurateur, and I've been in, in this position for for three years, so I'm learning a lot about the politics of this, but I can say very strongly that the, uh, the tourist value of this community from an economic standpoint does exactly come from what George has said, from the, the nature value of, of the community, the, the, hiking, the hikers, the skiers, the, the people that enjoy the pristine environment. and. And Aspen would never survive in the I-70 corridor between here and Grand Junction because our community that comes and spends money here are the people that love to see the difference between this environment and that environment. And there are appropriate places, as you have said, there are appropriate places to drill and not appropriate places to drill. So hopefully the conversation will continue and we'll find a solution with all the parties that are involved to um, to protect an area that protects our economy. Okay, we're open as we have been uh, to be able to participate in those and, and try and seek the best solution we can. Okay. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I know that it's uh, from the industry's point of view that they're they're fearful that that some sort of legislation like this would be setting a precedent. But but I, I we don't believe so. Uh, we believe this is a, a unique area. Uh, you, it's an area that's in the heart of the White River National Forest. It's a most heavily visited forest, U.S. national forest in the country. It's in the heart of the largest roadless area in the state of Colorado. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, as you have said, and it's been repeated, um, that there are some unique and special places that should be set aside um, based on what else they have to offer versus um, speculative uh, short-term economic games with some long-term environmental uh, detriments. Um, but as we're talking about, why why would we want to have federal legislation protect an area like Thompson Divide uh, versus doing something locally? I think perhaps another uh, discussion point would be your uh, proposed legislation uh, regarding uh, is House Bill um, regarding the uh, powder horn issue. No. So, so, so there's water rights like, protection. Water rights. So there's 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 another example where you've got uh, proposed federal legislation that that one side or the other could say, well, this this could be a concern of to set a president, but but in, but 
but it shouldn't. And I'll, I'll let Rob sort of speak to, to that issue. We had, we had a discussion about this uh, yesterday, in fact. Yeah, we had a, was it yesterday, a couple days ago? We had a brief discussion about it. And, you know, it, it goes back to our, our tourist economy here, protecting the private property rights of the ski area here. I mean, we're, I think, as a, as a board, 100% behind that concept. Mm -hmm. We're a little bit concerned with the, uh, uh, the Trans Mountain uh, Pass flows and how the Does it impact them? Okay. I mean, FERC you could not, explain. FERC is not, FERC is not impacted. Because I know some other counties have done some research to, to and spoken out against how that's impacted. No, actually, I haven't, I haven't heard from any counties uh, that have been there. We've had a couple of environmental groups uh, that have tried to lead to that. It's inaccurate. Uh, FERC is not impacted. Uh, actually, what this codifies is existing pr uh, customs and practices. Uh, n does not in any fashion whatsoever uh, prohibit any sort of a amiable agreement uh, between two en entities to be able to uh, uh, address a, a specific issue. Uh, and, and it's effectively, if you like the status quo, if you like uh, the ability of uh, Aspen Ski Company to be able to have the right to the water that they paid for, the rights that they had developed, and I hope that you share with me this view that our, our farmers and ranchers are just as important uh, in that regard. Uh, we're standing up for Colorado water rights, our priority-based system, uh, and uh, Colorado state law. If, if it's possible, that get your office to send that information to us so we have a full view of overlooking that bill. Um, what, what we understand, at least, uh, your initial bill, which we, which we uh, uh, thought, thought was a great idea because it did protect uh, industries right to maintain their water rights without having to uh, uh, come up with a different contractual arrangement with the U.S. Forest Service. But then what we understand was that that the initial bill has been broadened beyond the Department of Ag to include the Department of Interior, which brings in the Bureau of Reclamation, and then well, actually it's BLM uh, and Forest Service. So the BLM so it doesn't bring in the uh, Bureau of Reclamation at all. Not to my knowledge. Okay. We, we, we were thinking it did, and if that were the case, then you have this issue in terms of the, the current requirements uh, to maintain bypass waters, which would... Uh, no, uh, we, we uh, went to great, great lengths, George, uh, visiting. That's why, why you've got uh, uh, Colorado Water Congress has endorsed the bill. They had the concerns about some of the bypass flows that were going to be in there. That's why we had amended portions of the bill to make sure that we weren't going to be impacting existing uh, obligations and prohibiting uh, any, any future agreements that may be made. All right, it would be good to get, get an updated uh, version of that for us, for us to, to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve? Um, you did mention farmers and ranchers and the water rights held and developed by ranchers on mm -hmm. public lands are extremely important and extremely valuable to the ranchers. And there are some of those kind of things in Picking County. It's it's more in dry, dry areas where they have to do more extensive water developments, but those water rights are really critical to the farmers and ranchers. And this is this whole ski area water right thing issue is very similar to that, right. in that the water rights are an integral part of the operating the business. Ab absolutely, and uh, I think as. As Westerners, as Coloradans, uh, we have a long history in state law, in priority-based systems, private property rights, uh, to make sure that we're defending that uh, from the overreach of the federal government. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, in my estimation, it's not going to be acceptable to have the Forest Service, who, this wouldn't have been an issue had they not tried to expand their authorities and make the water grab. But they did. Now they're trying to back off of it. Uh, this is why we need the legislation to be able to codify what, as Coloradoans, we've held as our right, uh, and has been held up by court cases as well, by the way, uh, to be able to deal with and, and to be able to protect that. Hmm. Good. The, um, maybe give an update on some of the other things you're working on. Certainly, uh, your, uh, your work 
to continue to ensure PILT, uh, payment in lieu for taxes, uh, continues on because, as you know, uh, many of the counties here in the Western Slope where we're uh, so heavily, uh, uh, most of our acres is in national forests or public lands um, to, to have those extra dollars that not only go into the county, but also percentage goes into the schools sure. as well. You bet. Uh, and, and actually on the schools, we're trying to address that on the two front level. Uh, I spearheaded the letter we were able to get, I believe it was 45 uh, representatives, great bipartisan support, Western legislators, uh, to be able to come on to encourage the budget conferees to be able to preserve and make sure that we are fulfilling the payments on the PILT uh, resources. A lot of us are the uh, sense that if we are the, the nation's playground, we've got to be able to have the resources. You as county commissioners uh, have always paid uh, or been put in probably one of the more challenging situations of trying to be able to build out a budget when you didn't know what you were going to have or when you were going to get it. Uh, and it was always perpetually underfunded uh, to be able to come in. Uh, this has impacted our ability to be able to maintain infrastructure, to be able to support our schools. So uh, we put this in uh, with, uh, that's a pretty strong statement to get 45 representatives to, to sign on and I think We'll probably pick up a few others now that uh, you know it's officially in and be able to resubmit uh, that as well. Going into the budget conference, into the world, have another piece of legislation that I did introduce uh, here right before the break called education and energy to be able to, without a tax increase uh, or eliminating any environmental requirements, as new development happens on public lands and royalties are going to be being paid. We capture above the uh, 2000, anything above the 2013 royalty payments made to the federal government. 50% of that is taken and brought back uh, to states for education. 30%, uh, 33% of it actually, back to the state of origin. An additional 17% is then pooled and distributed to other states uh, that don't have energy development for education with no strings attached so that. Uh, we're, we're helping fund education without a tax increase. We're entrusting our local teachers, our local administrators, our local communities to be able to make good decisions uh, when it comes to education in creating energy and job security in this country. Thank you for doing okay. that. Yeah, I think uh, it's good. Uh, one other that you might be interested in or a couple others that you might be interested in uh, we have uh, passed through the full house now. Uh, it became uh, co-joined with um, uh, uh, the chair of natural resources, uh, Doc Hastings bill. Uh, our portion of it was the Healthy Forest Management and Wildfire Act 2013 that empowers our county commissioners uh, working with the governor to be able to identify areas of imminent threat and to be able to get in and treat those areas. Uh, that has passed the full House of Representatives. It now sits on the doorstep of the United States Senate. Uh, I hope you'll encourage our senators, uh, Colorado senators, to support and ask for the moving of that legislation. Uh, this is important not only for the West, uh, but particularly for the state of Colorado, and particularly for the 3rd Congressional District uh, of Colorado to be able to uh, actually help, help address some of the real challenges that we're facing with the threat of wildfire. And, Hopefully we'll get good snow up in the hills and mitigate that, but it's not going to revive those dead trees. Uh, you know, that is still going to be a problem uh, that we are going to have to be able to deal with. Uh, we do have um, the um, uh, Planning for America's Energy Future Act that, again, has cleared the full House of Representatives. Uh, that has moved on now over to the Senate once again. Uh, this calls for all of the above. Uh, to be able to meet energy needs in this country. It enumerates wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, as well as traditional fuel sources uh, in the country. Uh, a good positive piece of legislation to be able to meet uh, what is impacting a lot of our communities, a lot of our folks around the third uh, that are on fixed incomes, and that's primarily our senior citizens and our young folks uh, to be able to hold those energy prices down uh, for what we're paying for electricity and for heat. Uh, and so that's, a, I think, a good piece of legislation that, uh, again, is sitting on the doorstep of the Senate. We hope that they'll take that piece of legislation up. Uh, and as soon as we pass, when we're talking about uh, the Protecting Our Water Rights Act, that will be before the full House. If I didn't mention this, 
uh, in January or, or probably at the latest first or second week of February. Yeah, as you know, Colorado has just passed uh, probably the most, um, I don't know if you call it restrictive, but um, uh, tight air quality uh, measures regarding uh, oil and gas development. Is that something that that you would see move forward on a national level in terms of having those those high? Uh, levels uh, I like think this is something best left to our states rather than national one size fits all standards. Uh, we've got a lot of different types of geography, a lot of different issues uh, that exist in different parts of the country. Uh, you know, you drive down Valley, maybe a little bit here as well. Uh, you get these micro. Uh, uh, inversions that will come in for short periods of time uh, to be able to do that and, and one size fits all policy out of Washington isn't always the best thing uh, to ask for uh, because uh, it can have some unintended consequences that uh, we may not like to be able to see. The other issue that seems to be pressing uh, is the, um, the issue regarding the, the farm bill. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak speak to that. Yeah, yeah. The farm bill. Uh, you know, I've called for passage of the farm bill. We, uh, in in the course of the the markups on the committees, you know, I addressed. Uh, we'd we'd reached out throughout Colorado since I'm Colorado's only member on the ag committee in the House, uh, and it was going to be on research on conservation uh, and insurance uh, were the primary issues that we'd heard from out of our county commissioners, uh, or not county commissioners, out of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, uh, out of the Farm Bureau and, and uh, other assorted ag groups. Uh, visiting with Chairman Lucas, he thinks that there's a, a very positive chance that we're going to finally get this done. Uh, I'm not sure it's now going to happen specifically by the end of December, uh, which means uh, it's going to have to be done within the next two weeks, more than likely. Uh, if that becomes the case, we'll probably see a short-term extension on the uh, dairy policy because that does expire uh, at the end of December. Uh, but I, I believe that we will see that finally consummated. So. There, is, there has been this, this concern that if that doesn't pass, and all, all of a sudden milk prices are going to rise, and that's certainly going to affect yeah. that's certainly, uh, some of the lower-income folks who uh, will affect sort of their, their food stamp programs. Um, and I think, George, that. that's that's why the you know you'll definitely if 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 the entire bill isn't reconciled and brought to a floor uh, vote uh, before the the end of December, I think you will see a, a at least an extension on the dairy policy so that that is not impacted. That's already some of the discussions going on. Yeah. Maybe you can give us sort of a, a quick update, at least from your point of view, since. Uh, um, I don't think your meeting with ACRA was, was filmed, uh, but I'm sure the discussion uh, was centered around immigration, and, and I think we're very in line uh, as county commissioners with uh, the same direction that ACRA is in terms of the importance of passing uh, an immigration bill that, that uh, brings uh, these folks into, you know, uh, into the ability to, to participate in, in, within the country. Yeah, we had a very positive discussion uh, that, uh, uh, none too surprisingly, probably one of the bigger uh, misrepresentations I think actually we've seen nationwide is, is that you've got people for and against it. Uh, virtually everyone I've talked to believes that we've got a broken immigration policy uh, that needs to be able to be addressed. We need to be able to have, uh, I, I was talking two and a half years ago about a broken immigration policy. Uh, in this country, the need for a viable guest worker program uh, to be able to address not only the hospitality needs but also the farm and ranch needs as well as the construction needs that we see in the, in, in the nation, uh, to be able to have it be on a supply and demand basis rather than on the arbitrary basis that we currently see under H2A, H2B, uh, that's going to be worker friendly but also employer friendly. Uh, and that was some of the discussion that we had had that. Uh, they did indicate that they'd like to be able to have the tools to work with to where, uh, as hotel operators, they're not the policemen for the government. They ought to be able to rely on the instruments that the federal government has provided to verify that the person that is there is there legally, uh, if they have done their, their due diligence. 
And so uh, we had a lot of good commonality, uh, invited them to be able. I passed on uh, Warren Klug, who's had uh, a couple of ideas that uh, fulfilled my word to him over the course of several months, uh, making sure that some of the thoughts that were being presented by he and others in the group were being delivered to Chairman Goodlatte, uh, who's on the Judiciary Committee uh, that is in the process of writing the series of bills that will be seen coming out of the House of Representatives. Uh, invited their continued input into that and some of the assessment of bills as they move out of committee and ultimately to potential floor vote uh, for some of the thoughts that they may have to be able to get the best work product uh, and contribute on that end. So what do you tell tell folks, tell us, uh, when we look at Washington and, and, and you've got, let's say, the immigration bill, where you've got a bill that, that has been drafted and put together uh, from the Senate side, and Senator Bennett was very involved in that. And then you've got another bill that's being worked on and looked at from the House side, but but neither of the two could ever meet, and, and that's just one issue. I mean, how, and the country sort of sees Washington as just being so dysfunctional because the, the two sides, the two parties, uh, can't even come to the table to come up with a reasonable compromise. It's, it's either one side, it's all or none. So, uh, you know, that's sort of a frustration I'm sure you've heard uh, from, a, from around the state and from around your district. Um, uh, well, I, I think it would be a, a premature and an inaccurate assessment of saying that uh, uh, the, the two shall never meet. Uh, the House is going through the process right now of addressing uh, specific areas uh, of, of the host of issues uh, that exist, uh, you know, when it comes uh, to immigration. And uh, to say that, uh, you know, there, there won't be, I think that you've seen a big change over the course of the last month. Uh, you heard uh, the president embrace the step-by-step -step process that has been uh, being promoted by the House of Representatives. You heard John Boehner come out and say that immigration is not, reform is not dead, this Congress. And uh, I think too often it becomes far too easy uh, to just buy into, uh, you know, uh, Differences of opinion, uh, the legislative process in Washington in particular is slow. Uh, you know, this year only 60 bills have become law. Mine is one of them, the Small Hydroelectric and Jobs Act uh, of 2013 that went through the whole process uh, to be able to do that. But I think that that is uh, something that is in process, and I think um, the people that believe that, as uh, I have stated, that we should have immigration reform, that we do need border security in this country, uh, that uh, uh, ought to be heartened when we're hearing the president see that portion of it, the speaker see the other side of it, that, uh, uh, you know, it is not washed away and that uh, the opportunity to move forward can exist. Well, thank you. Yeah. Other uh, questions or comments, thoughts, Steve? Um, I'm glad you mentioned your hydro, small hydro bill. I wanted to thank you for supporting that. Um, I've, I've worked quite a bit over the years with a group of people advocating for small hydro projects. And I just heard the first project in Silverton has gotten, that's right, gone through and been approved. Right. So that's the first one to benefit. And it's not a very big project. But it isn't. That's but, the way uh, with a lot of this. Yeah. Small hydro projects aren't very big, but the sum total of all of them exactly. could be enormous. Exactly, and the uh, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe is also looking at a facility uh, down on the reservation outside of Toyok. Uh, there are a variety of different projects. Uh, it's my understanding in uh, Arizona and elsewhere uh, that uh, we're anticipating this is probably going to be about a year in process because until uh, our bill passed and was signed literally into law, uh, they weren't willing to, to move forward with any type of planning on this. Uh, Steve Daines out of Montana has another companion piece that I've co-sponsored on hydropower. And uh, this is, uh, I think, some good positive steps on, uh, you know, certainly some of the cleanest energy that we can produce uh, that, that are now beginning to move forward. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Also, uh, speaking about the bipartisan efforts towards immigration reform. Uh, I think the people of the United States would like to see more of those kind of efforts from all 
our elected representatives on both sides of the aisle. And I think the, the I don't know if they call it the gang of eight, the group of eight in the Senate that worked on a, bringing forward an immigration proposal is just an example of the way we'd like to see sure. th see things being done in Washington more. And that's one thing I think we're proud of out of our office. Uh, the bills that I just listed off, the hydroelectric bill, uh, the Planning for America's Energy Future Act, uh, the Healthy Forest Management Wildfire Act, uh, the Protecting Our Water Rights Act, every bill that I put through the full House of Representatives, uh, three of which now have become ultimately law, uh, all passed with bipartisan support. Uh, but we do reach out, we do talk, we do listen. Uh, there, there are certain things that we can agree on and some that we know we won't, and that works both ways. Uh, but there are areas that we can typically find some common ground to be able to work off of. When we're talking about the Farm Bill, uh, we're in conference. Uh, that's how part of the process works. We have a budget conference that is going on uh, right now as well. So I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to see some of that activity to be able to address some of the challenges that we truly have. Okay. Right. Congressman, first I'm going to say, because I like hearing it from my people, that thank you for serving, because I know how hard it is to hear all the different opinions and have, uh, you know, be out there fighting for what you think is right. And I really appreciate you. You know, I was in three meetings with you earlier today, and I think everything that I've heard, I think, comes from your heart, from what you're hearing from the people. and. What I'd really like to do is ask um, what Warren Klug asked from the ACRA point of view, but mm -hmm. now from the county commissioners, how can we create a better communication channel between your office and our offices here as a county within your district? Um, because we often, uh, we often do write letters about Bennett's bills and this and that, and I could see us writing letters about the Pilt bill and, mm -hmm. and the hydroelectric, which, is, which, as you said, is already in law. And, you know, I'd like to know more about the wire or the wildfire act and you know all of these bills as as probably most people out there in the listening audience know um, are very complicated and they're not all 100 percent perfect and you know it's easy just like um, you know the water uh, protection act for ski areas and property rights um, to find halls but to have an open communication is really what's important. Mm -hmm. For us to be able to express to you what our opinion is here as a county and for you to be able to ask support for the things that we would be supporting and, and uh, explain your side of the position. Right. Um, because, you know, I've heard a lot of these, uh, these things that you've mentioned several times and they're there are a lot of things that help our community too. The Wildfire Act, the Farmer's Bill, um, and, and I'd like to support you on, on those. Well, we appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I'll certainly be talking to our office. Uh, as you know, we've got, uh, the office over in Junction and, uh, you know, they, they would have actually been here today and some of the roads, uh, were creating a bit of a challenge, uh, to be able to be in. And, uh, the more we can open that up, one thing we'd experimented with, uh, and I, I don't think you guys were on at the time was uh, just being able to get about four or five of our counties together and we just have a phone conference periodically uh, to be able to get some of the feedback. I think it was more a matter of timing, uh, you know, uh, Washington time versus Colorado time, uh, county commissioners meetings, you know, it just got, got to be a little bit of a logistical nightmare. But whatever we can do uh, to help facilitate that good open communication to be able to hear your thoughts uh, and your ideas. Uh, is is important for us as well and much like the uh, the immigration bill not everything is perfect and it's easy to say you know we don't like that because of one or two little things and now I understand that there are bills that are coming from the house piece by piece as you're saying and, and if they're good pieces we'd like to get behind those and help you move that legislation forward but well I, I appreciate that because as, as you do and you you probably get this as county commissioners uh, you know, with the information that you have, you're trying to make some of the best choices that you can. And, uh, and uh, respectfully, people have the right to be able to disagree on some of those approaches that are going to be there. And they probably won't be perfect models, uh, but uh, 
that's probably going to be some of the better product that we're going to be able to get ultimately because it won't be perfect for everyone at all times. So, great. Well, well thank, thank you. you. You haven't been through uh, through this neck of the woods. I think it's been a few years for us. So again, no, I think it's been. Uh, I've been through here a little quicker years. than that. So two 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 years well, ago when I first yeah. took office. Yeah. So it's. Uh, I thank you again. It, it's always a great opportunity for us to have uh, some face time. Uh, with our representatives and so you can hear directly our concerns and, and have a discussion from your point of view as well and so i think that's always valuable Good. and i'll correct that scott has been here several times over several the last, but, but in front of us the was the last time i, I think it was two yes. years ago okay. yes yeah. well and we appreciate you you've set up i guess a special so i appreciate you your your willingness to be able to do that so it, We'll try when we're swinging through because we have been through. That's what I was pointing out too. No, 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 been through, yeah, we're, we're talking two different things. Yes, uh, uh, I think we've been there four or five it, times this year. It's very and even if you only have time for one or two of you to even get a cup of coffee or something like that, more than happy to do that too. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very Great. much. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. So. Thank you. Thanks. So much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. you too, sir. So I will adjourn our special meeting and uh, grassroots. Thank you. Thank you.